So I'm delighted to introduce uh, Sharon Prince. She's the CEO and founder of Grace Farms Foundation, an interdisciplinary humanitarian institution that seeks six P's through nature, the arts, justice, community, and faith. Sharon also leads Design for Freedom, a new movement aimed at eliminating forced labor in the building material supply chain. In this regard, Sharon uh, launched Design for Freedom with a groundbreaking report in 2020, which I really uh, encourage you to read. And in 2022, just a year ago, she released the Design for Freedom Toolkit, a resource that professionals can, can use to integrate Design for Freedom principles into their practice. Most of us have seen the stunning architecture of Grace Farms in New Canaan, Connecticut, that Sharon commissioned Sanaa to design, and you will see more today, just incredible piece of architecture. This work has earned numerous awards for contribution to architecture, environmental sustainability, and social good, including the AIA National 2017 Architecture Honors Award and the Mies Crown Hall America's Prize. Sharon is also a social entrepreneur. She will show you today a few things about that. Um, he co she co-founded uh, Grace Farms Foods, a premium tea and coffee certified corporation that educates the public about uh, of work um, uh, that Grace Farms uh, uh, does and demonstrate ethical and sustainable supply chains. Sharon's leadership has been widely recognized. She received the New York City Visionary Award for from the AIA New York and the Center for Architecture. And Fast Company, the very well-known uh, magazine and, and, and um, <laughs> institution, named her one of the most creative people in business for cleaning up construction. Let us welcome Sharon to the podium. Thank you, Thank you Thank you. Thank you. Terrific. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for this invitation. At professors I see here too, Dean also. So great to be here because I love being with students because you're thinking and imagining what the future of the built environment is going to be among other things. And during this time, I wanna make sure you think about your own agency. You're gonna find that what I'll be sharing today is something that you can take with you in your with your first project, actually even right here at, at Catholic University. You can take it into your next job right away. And quite often with architecture, you feel like it takes, a, you know, there's a longer runway to having a, an impact, but you're going to find out that you're going to have, be able to have an immediate impact. So, so this is, this is Grace Farms and it was intended and aims to be a driver for humanitarian outcomes with unpressed, uh, the main thing to know here is that it's also designed to be a generative platform for new outcomes. And I'm going to describe two of those new outcomes that are un with unprecedented models. And there's no existing models, one being the river building. So I wanna go into that with you since you're architecture students primarily, and then also design for freedom. So, is that good? Yeah. <laughs> so this is Grace Farms and it is situated in New Canaan, Connecticut, about an hour north of New York City on 80 acres. The first move was to actually conserve their land. It was slavery broken up into 10 large parcels. So that was the first move. And then you can see, am I saying the right one? Yep. And and it's also a place to have a, a it's a porous membrane, a place to collaborate, bring people together. And one of the things to note, it was a, a former equestrian farm. So there's two, you can see two uh, of the barn wings are on the, are, are flanking this image. And then the river building is in the distance. This is how you would walk into Grace Farms. And there was a center section that was removed to also lower the height. When we talk about, and I know you are, regenerative materials, reuse and circularity, that actually comes into play for design for freedom. We reuse these two wings and they're used for, you can see there's an art installation and there's also meeting spaces for other nonprofits that align with us and so forth. But this is what the porosity means. The river building itself is situated on a knoll, starts at the top and has an undulating form with about 43 foot elevation change. 
And that allows for a vista out into landscape, but also you're able to see people along the river. Part of the concept was to create both a peaceful respite and an active community. And in doing so, it's also to create an ambulatory experience so you can move, have new perspectives, evoke curiosity, and embed values in the space. This is where an architect friend of mine said, space communicates. And that was something that really started the whole, it really germinated the whole idea for Grace Farms. Like what could space do that other things could not in terms of advancing good in the world? So we're able to think with a clean slate. And you can see that this, the, it's the um, building itself, you can see along the river, right? This is part of actually in the center section. Ah, thank you. There's art um, installations here. And it's a hopeful space. We're also, uh, from the beginning, the in terms of the, the stake in the ground, in terms of justice, was to end modern slavery. So needing a space like this was important. In fact, when we opened, we had the Un United Nations University, multi-sectoral convenings, and it was an alive space. It's a hopeful space and, and necessary as we do this work. Now, the five initiatives that you described, the first being... The first move is creating a common denominator for all in terms of being a publicly available place that's free and open to the public. We wanted a place you can experience nature. And this is, you can see, there's many different um, ecosystems here. I mean, um, um, biodiverse areas, which we preserved. It's really quite beautiful in all seasons. And then we also are threading the arts throughout the space too. And that is a means to actually open the, the lens on with world views. We have had hundreds of artists come to Grace Farms. Now we're at year eight, we opened in 2015. So that's important. And it also enables us to, to have a entry point for all as we uh, work on different issues. The other part is to be able to foster community through this ability to have people that are both local, global, various backgrounds is very important to the concept. And that part of even something simple like the tables that are stationary, pretty heavy. There's not many heavy things. Everything's pretty light in terms of what sauna designed, but they're meant to be a place you have to stick your fork in the, in the table. Well, not literally, but that you could all uh, be around a table and, um, and have conversation and be again in a space that is, uh, part of the, is like the, the center area of the river. We have proximity and, and also perspectives all along. The one thing too is uh, in terms of the pursuit of justice, that stake in the ground uh, to end modern slavery turns out to be the, the unprecedented outcome of design for freedom. I had built Grace Farms and had not even thought about the materials. I thought about the job site being insured of being of using fair labor, but not the building materials. And I explained how that happened. This is the kinds of conversations we've had here. This is Nicholas Kristoff and Nobel Peace Prize winner, Dr. McQuaggy. Had conversations, we've had um, much work in terms of looking at policies, both locally and globally. And, uh, and I'll explain how Design for Freedom ensued. Okay. The other area was exploring faith. And this again is creating first a, a space that would be reflective and allow for us to come, people come from all backgrounds to, to ask the questions of what makes life worth living? What is a flourishing life? And, and have, we have just a small amount of books here, but they represent uh, all of our initiatives. This is a very active uh, library on the right a sanctuary space on the left that I just showed you right there. That's the sanctuary. And that's also a quiet space during the, the week for anyone to come in and have a moment of reflection. We've been working with uh, the Yale Center for Faith and Culture. And uh, that is another, we have you know, different partners again to start to examine those questions. So then you, you come up with a concept so you come with the concept I'll show and you need people to activate it and also to actualize it. So this is a Sejima and uh, Kazuyo Sejima of Sana. And we're here walking, this is partly built here in the landscape. 
And it was, a, someone asked me, what was the process too for selecting Sonnet? That's a, that's another conversation, but they were never tethered to what it meant to have all of these five initiatives in one place. And what I described too was very aspirational, right? There's some times even polar opposites, like peaceful respite in an active community, a porous place and a place that also um, is ambulatory and all those different aspects and all five initiatives. They were actually the, the ones who could, uh, who, we, even though we're there in Japan, there is no language barrier because of the aspirational qualities of what we were trying to achieve. I love this image because it shows what's possible. Like we had so many concepts that we were able to, you know, really explore to determine whether or not the puzzle that we were presenting could be actualized through design. And the river building itself was one that, um, I'll hold on for a second. Uh, the river building itself is one I think they probably thought was the most uh, ambitious or thought that that might not be the one that we choose, but it actually solved the puzzle for all the con for all the uh, the 35 page program that we put together. And to give you some background, I had never built anything. I'm not an architect. I am an entrepreneur. So my role in the whole process was not to design, which I think there's always you know a little inkling probably from clients who want to design a little bit, you might, you might have, uh, have seen that or, or uh, sometimes part of the process, but th my role was to ensure that we're reaching the goals that we set out. And so I can mark to market where the plan was achieving that. I did not see a rendering for two years, only models. So this is the beginning. I have a whole other set of models that we went through to design. And when we did select the river building in Japan, they said, okay, now go out to the Sito Islands, which we did, and went to Teshma. This is the island of Teshma. And it's just so important to also be immersed in what is new and possible too with them. For us, It was, this is Teshma Museum. I don't know if you're familiar with this, but it's worth taking a look at. It is extraordinary. There's one art piece in this, in this uh, museum. And uh, that was helpful to us. Then we also went to the other islands and saw some other pieces of Sejimas. That was Nishizawa's. In, in Japan, they each have their own practices for Japan. most of the Japanese um, projects. And yet the out, outside, like sauna, I mean, um, like in the U.S. with us, it was sauna to them together. So here we are at their at their uh, warehouse type of studio. And what I loved is that we're you're creating a place of grace and peace, a place that we're pursuing a more humane future, human dignity, having diverse. And you can see too, Sejima is right in the middle. There's no hierarchy, uh, just exploding with ideas too. And um, this is to me also important because like I said, we didn't, didn't have a chance to see a rendering. And that is actually a good thing. I realize now more so because you're not, really uh, committed to a material or an actual form. I mean, there's there, this way we could look at, are we achieving the goal again? Uh, this is, I think this one might've been uh, six volumes where we end up with five. And then we had many, we explored many different scenarios where we kept two of the wings of the barn, one, uh, it, was, it was pretty exciting to be able to be in that realm where you are, are not um, still even married to one concept. This is some. Of, this is exactly what we would see. You know what I saw, and it looks quite similar to what was achieved. And then there's the the elevation change, and the reason this is important is that the immersion in materials in the process for me is what helped to unearth design for freedom as a movement. This is one of the images by Thomas Demond that is really substantial and part of the library installation there. And it shows the iterative process of what we did. I can look at each one of these and remember, okay, that didn't achieve the goal, this does. And that's the underlayment of the roof. And then you go into, okay, that was just the, the modeling. And now we have to, then we started to look at how do we model some of the roof? I went through three different roof um, mock-ups and that was also very important to achieving the goal as well. 
And then we, then we went to fabrications a couple of years for the glass. It looks very simple, but did not want to have black mullions that would, that would really eliminate the vistas. And so there was many years to just, uh, we worked with front to be able to produce that outcome. So again, immersed in materials, right? This is the, it looks like it's light on the land, which it is, but the amount of materials voluminous. And then you start to also build. And at this point, I thought it's sculpturally beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> Don't even want to go any further. It's just, it was really something, but you can see too, I could see all the different layers. I was on the roof and you can see here, the underlayments, it's, these are all the materials uh, that are actually fraught, wood, steel, this cold roll steel, glass and so forth. But being a part of the process, being a part of the construction, is what really enabled um, to, uh, for me to understand materials in general. This is Design for Freedom. So Design for Freedom is the movement to remove force and child labor from the building material supply chain. You can think of it as a, uh, like first food is called to be accountable to supply chain, then clothing, next will be shelter and it's happening. So we formally launched the movement a few years ago and it, there's a sense of urgency because this is unlike the green building movement in that, yes, the building the built environment has a relationship to nature, but it's also people. And the question that brought leaders around the table is, is your building ethically sourced as well as sustainably designed? And the answer has been, we don't know. Do not know. Where did all these materials come from? We have, there's, there's not, a, you can think about too, clothing has a country of origin even on it. So it doesn't tell you the full supply chain end to end, but there are thousands of materials in our buildings and uh, very few have a end to end supply chain recognition. And particularly then you think about the provenance of materials and certainly not adding fair labor inputs yet. So on-site labor is one half the equation, 50%, nearly 45, 50% of the building's cost are the building materials and they need to be inspected for fair labor. The next step in architecture justice must include social equity and ethical material transparency. The good news is that we have started to do, to really investigate embodied carbon. Now we're looking at the provenance of materials, very important in terms of determining who are making those materials. So it's very promising that way. We're also now looking at what is the embedded suffering and the embodied suffering in these same materials. This is a recent study that I encourage you to open up. It is the building materials and the climate. This report has been two years in the making, the Yale Center for Ecosystems and Architecture and Dyson is one of the leads. It's also in conjunction with the UNEP. It's a fantastic deep dive into the materials uh, that are the, the primary materials that go into our building. And also they, it does include design for freedom, which has a layer of, of um, you know, a fair labor, it has a layer of labor in the equation in terms of decarbonization. We coined a new term, ethical decarbonization, because you can think about all the tactics that we are aspiring to employ and you know, deploy and develop in terms of decarbonization. And we have to, we do have to think about the, the people who are making those, um, those, the, the um, whether it be wind turbines, solar panels, all, and also the building materials themselves. So one of the main uh, arguments or the, the, subject matter of this whole report is that building materials will be dominating uh, climate change in the future. So here we go. So there's a section here about a, avoid, shift, and improve, and it does include design for freedom. It includes um, also ethically uh, producing, not ethically producing low carbon earth and bio-based building materials. Also, there's another, there's a new book by ILFI, the regenerative materials movement. And there's a chapter early on that, uh, that I was able to in be included in as called embodied suffering or building materials. So we are working not to create a separate lane for design for freedom, but to be in, in part of the new means and methods. 
and also the work that's being done with, like I say, USGBC, ILFI, well, and so forth, all the EPDs, HPDs, and that way it, we're starting to add in labor, which is great. All right, we talked about that. Next is shelter. Here we go. And um, and so construction is the large globalized industrialized sector at the highest risk of forced and child labor. So the scale of it is astonishing, is brutal. And I, what's really pretty, which was very important about Design for Freedom and what you do is that it's, you can think about over many centuries, many cities were built on with, with slave labor. So this is a longstanding issue and it's no different today, but in terms of the global flows, it's hard to, to see, right? It's, it's much more hidden and we have the capacity though to actually uh, you know, start to make a change. So we defined the first, the first to define the 12 materials that are at risk. And the key uh, risk factors are really aligned with the construction sector, hazardous undesirable working conditions, Migrant workforce, one of the the, the um, primary contributors or risk factors for modern slavery. These are all in our report too. And here's the slavery index. The slavery. This is a um, the global slavery index comes out um, about this one's every five years. And um, I think say the global. This is 2023. It's the first time solar panels are on the cover. Something else you can look into. And uh, it's that they're valuing the solar panels as the fourth highest risk of at risk um, at 14.8 billion. And there's a de the definitions thereof too, that'll help you, um, you know, if you're not familiar, but there's definitions there to understand modern slavery is defined as situations of exploitation that persons cannot refuse or leave because of threats, violence, coercion, deception, and or abuse. So there's 28 million, which is hard to grasp. And many of those are making the building materials that go into our buildings. Before I get into the laws, I'm going to take a break. And, and, and well, we're going to, uh, I'm going to show a video here too, that will give you the synopsis thus far. And also show you uh, some feedback from the pilot projects that I'll describe in a minute too. This is the trick of the day. Are our buildings ethically sourced? Are they sustainably designed? Are they free of forced and child labor? At Grace Farms, we are reimagining architecture as a porous, hopeful living platform to create more grace and peace in the world. Architecture can break down barriers between people and sectors, can put you in proximity to issues and can create new outcomes. We are reimagining architecture as a driver of humanitarian outcomes, to design for freedom, to design a more humane built environment. Every day, building materials that are made with forced labor make their way into our buildings, landscapes, and homes. An estimated 28 million people are held in forced labor around the world, working with little or no pay in inhumane working conditions. Design for Freedom, launched by Grace Farms Foundation CEO and founder, Sharon Prince, is working to change that by creating a radical paradigm shift to remove forced labor from the building material supply chain. Just think about it. Over the past several decades, producers and consumers first focused on the ethics and sustainability of food, then clothing, the next sector that demands our attention is shelter. Through these pilot projects, 
Design for Freedom is spotlighting this humanitarian crisis incorporating ethical and sustainable building practices and enlarging capacity among design and construction teams, owners, manufacturers, and the public itself. Envisioned by Chelsea Thatcher, Grace Farms Foundation's creative director, these pilot projects are committed to our Design for Freedom principles, supply chain transparency and ethical material procurement. We work together with our partners to put this into action and address sustainable development goals so that ESG investors will also start to prioritize these principles. The construction industry is, after all, the largest industrialized sector at the greatest risk of modern slavery. Conscious investment coupled with social responsibility will surely bring about market transformation. The first international pilot project is Black Chapel, by artist Theaster Gates. This striking structure is the Serpentine Pavilion's prestigious annual commission. We were able to trace plywood and timber, steelwork, concrete, and the weatherproofing material as far upstream in the supply chain as possible, and in some cases to the point of raw material extraction. This effort shows it's actually possible to build with materials that do not use forced labor. A new arts and culture center is the first pilot project in Asia. When completed, the complex will be the largest of its kind in the world. As Sunil Mujal of Serendipity Arts remarked at this year's Design for Freedom Summit, we are not just looking at fair practices of what we do ourselves, but also of our suppliers and how they treat people, how they treat the ecosystem, and how they treat the environment. Shadow of a Face a monument to Harriet Tubman, designed by Nuna Cook John, is another of our pilot projects. The work will be a focal point of the newly renamed Tubman Square. Cook John is a transformative and versatile architect and sculptor, working at a human scale, and is concerned with how space is used in our everyday lives. So I think once we realize that people are the center of architecture and it's not about an abstract understanding of materials or space, then when we go back to the selection of the materials and really understand that there were people involved in making these materials. They're not only thinking about the craftsmen and the conditions in which they're working, but how they're sourcing the materials. How are the people who are, you know, getting the rubber from that tree, who are felling the timber to be used in the building, really understand that humanity touches every single step along the way, I think allows us to reimagine how architecture fits into the rest of our lives. So it doesn't only become about the final product as um, you know, an abstract beautiful thing that sits on top of a hill, but how it directly affects the lives of people from one end to the next. Before being involved with the Design for Freedom mission, I didn't really understand um, how almost every single thing within the building materials that we use in any project can really be touched by forced labor and along so many different portions of the supply chain, right? Grace Farms is also partnering with the New Canaan Library on their new state-of-the-art knowledge and learning center. It was at the behest of Debbie Probst, president of global retail at Miller Knoll, that the library became another of our pilot projects. Through key connections and visionaries like her, we are developing allies to encourage ethical sourcing. The library's award-winning design team includes Turner, one of the largest U.S. construction firms which is working more broadly to incorporate the principles of design for freedom. Miller Knoll is a, an organization whose purpose is design for the good of humankind. You know, we have a very um, rich DNA around doing good. Profit is the consequence of doing good and doing it well. And that is such a, a rich part of our DNA and our values. We do good through the world of design through many decisions we make on a daily basis. Whether it's thinking about the next innovative material that we're going after to reduce the carbon footprint on our manufacturing process, whether it's thinking about eliminating as much waste in our go-to-market strategies as we can, all of these things add up. And so as it pertains to the values and the mission behind Design for Freedom, it's so congruent with the work that we're already doing. 
And what is most important about this work that we do collectively is creating awareness. And so to give uh, Grease Farms Foundation and Design for Freedom a, a platform that has a, a strong voice in the space already just amplifies our mission at Miller & Old and creates a, a huge opportunity to engage a wide audience for Design for Freedom. The final of our inaugural pilot projects is Alison Schatz's Temporal Shift. The piece is a site-responsive sculpture that mirrors the Earth's orbit, a marker of our time and place in the universe. The reflections and shadows it casts through the course of the day prompt us to consider the moment in which we find ourselves. We trace the stainless steel and concrete used in the piece, 100% of which is ethically sourced. And we also are leading a new movement called Design for Freedom to create a radical paradigm shift and remove forced labor from the building materials supply chain, creating a more humane built environment. So you can see that we are connecting our investment. I had a different one that was shorter, so this is good. That's you don't need to see that. See, see me on that, but um, and then I'll figure out where. Let's go back to where we are. Um, that's helpful, though, right? To see also, it's important about this is to show that we are not only creating awareness but institutional responses, and that's through this opportunity today at Catholic University, but also with pilot projects. And that's really starting to create a deeper commitment by many organizations that are on the projects. So you can see that here. So I'm going to switch around where, uh, where we are, then I'll come back, I think. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Okay. Can I do that? Mm -hmm. I guess I'll just do that one. Okay. Back to that one. Okay. Um, so I will then be able to shorten some of the section on the pilot projects, but just to reiterate here, uh, Turner Construction is now a really important uh, partner with us. And there's others too, like Miller Knoll. That's another one who's like, if, if you know too, they have, they're one of the, the largest companies now in terms of not only furniture, but textiles. And uh, we're going to be putting together with Nina Cook John, a new exhibit that will be permanent at Grace Farms and will be opening in 2024. And all of those folks out here are all a part of it, plus many more. And okay, I'll go back to that. There's a little bit, we had a little issue on the, on the, on the video. So I'm gonna go back to the laws. Like why also is this again different than the green building movement? There are laws that do forbid the use of slave labor in the built environment. And yet our buildings, um, and the materials that go into them are reliant on it. We're in a marketplace that is thin margins, right? It's a disaggregated industry in terms of construction. And it is uh, is also ripe for uh, this the bad actors to, to come into the supply chain. But the good news is that countries are moving to make corporations more accountable. And there are many. It started with the California Supply Chain Act in 2010 that spawned other modern day slavery acts in the UK and elsewhere. Australia was a little different in 2018. It required even those that were investing in Australia to be in compliance and to have reports on the companies that were elsewhere, not um, you know, to also re report out. In the orange area on the US, we have two particular trade regulations that are very, that do have teeth. The Trade Facilitation and Enforcement Act of TIA in 2015, and it is one that uh, prohibits all goods made with forced labor from entry into, into the United States. And that includes the full supply chain. In that, in this case, the the requirement though is uh, that if you are asked if there's a suspicious cargo, you have to have proof. The difference then also, so that means that not every shipment, of course, is uh, inspected. However, the Uyghur Forced Labor Protection Act is a newer act that uh, has uh, started to really affect the solar, just think about solar um, panels that are held up at the border right now, uh, cotton, PVC, and so forth. But this, uh, this law require, regulation actually prohibits all goods made in the Uyghur region from entry into the United States. There's a rebuttal presumption, which means that all goods are barred and that there's no explanation. You have to prove that there isn't fair labor, which is really you know, quite, quite difficult to do. 
So, um, so that those two are actually making a difference. And the other products that are made in the Uyghur region are plentiful. And this is not the only region, of course, that has um, that is that has forced labor, but this is one that has been identified uh, with that law and has been very effective. There's also, it, which also matters to our industry, is timber itself. Illegally logged timber, 10 to 30 percent of all timber is um, expect is estimated to be illegally logged. There are laws also against against logged timber. So there's plentiful. So there's when you're working globally, you need to be aware too of these laws and also what's coming. There's a there's a back here too, I should show you on the um, European Union is also the corporate sustainability due diligence is coming up on that end and many more. So you're at a point two in time where these are going to have an effect on whether you have a substantial completion clause that's going to be able to be met if there's goods held up at the border. And also you can think about the AIA code of ethics. There's uh, 1.5 design for human dignity and the health, safety and welfare of the public and conduct. You have to uphold the laws. These are laws that exist. And also we've been working with the AIA also on the material pledge. Under equity, there's a section that does note the report and the toolkit. So that's good uh, to see that happening. And then quite often I get a question about, is this going to cost more? So for um, not only clients, but the whole design team, is this gonna cost more now? And uh, the way to think about that is instead, are we subsidizing our ROIs with slavery, the return on investment? Another way of saying that is, are, are we accepting the slavery discount? And that's a whole different way of thinking about it, right? Because now you have a market value right now. There's no inspection. Therefore, there's likelihood of forced labor making it cheaper. There's always, we're always driving costs lower in, in, in constructions, like lowest bidder quite often. And yet it raises the risk of human costs. So here's that price now, market price, the fair market value let's say it's up here, that, that delta is the slavery discount. And we should, you know, we can no longer accept that. I'm, we're trying now at Grace Farms to work with our partners to determine what is that delta. It's been out there, this term, the slavery discount is being adopted. Uh, I mean, though it's, a, it's an easily understood concept, right? Like, okay, now instead of it costing more, are we accepting the slavery discount? There's others um, that are within fast company architecture that are starting to also pick up design for freedom. So it's out there. We probably talked to 25,000 professionals, two dozen universities and so forth about the issue. And it's starting to get traction, which is good. So the risks again are plentiful reputation. You can remember like when we talk about space communicates, the walls will communicate eventually, you know, where all these materials come from. Uh, there's legal risk, there's financial risk. But there is opportunity. And this is what's exciting is to be able to think about uh, really prioritizing fair labor inputs. It's going to have not only uh, think about the oversight in terms of environmental protection, innovation, but also a more humane built environment. So the ecosystem of the built environment from the get go, we've been activating everyone. Architects are not, even from the beginning, architects would say, wait a minute, I'm just specifying. I'm not their procurement officer. I should not be, I should not have to be a part of this. Well, we are because uh, the specifiers are specifying the materials that determine where they are extracted. And that has a major influence, it has a significant influence. But also you can see here, we want to introduce design for freedom and ethical material transparency into all the aspects and these pressure points that are in blue. So owners and developers, the owner's project requirements could also be a, an area, not that you could say as an owner, let's say I was going to uh, commission a new project, I cannot say 100% of materials need to be made without forced labor. It's just not possible now, but we can start to make requirements and mandates that would um, examine a certain subset of those materials. That's what we're doing within our Design for Freedom pilot projects. You can also um, require more uh, documentation and use of the toolkits and so forth. So that can happen. And then uh, here we are at the university, education and research is happening. Stanford Civil Engineering Group is working on cement. We just started with them. We're going to activate 
with uh, Michael Crosby. Uh, we have a working group too of a hundred uh, you know leaders. We're going to be have introducing in the next year a competition for design for freedom on the in, in terms of projects, which is exciting for all universities. And um, and you can see all the different areas here and ways that we need the full ecosystem to participate. And it's happening. So Sol Il, Florian Einberg and Jing Liu said, this is in terms of architects. So if every line we draw affects the string of material practices with an ecological impact, it also affects a series of labor practices that impact human rights. Our designs define the labor need to extract the material from the earth, the labor to clean it, process it, assemble it, transport it, and to build it on a construction site. So we're all in on that. Here's the working group. So we have lots of different, you know, a variety and range of companies and institutions. Very important to have everyone at the table. So we can start to normalize fair pricing. University partners, you're right in the middle now. This is terrific. And we're eager to continue you know, to figure out how you can use your you know, your intelligence, research, and so forth to help prepare, uh, really propel the movement. And then in terms of creating transparency, AI, other um, aggregators of information are important. So we're working with Altana AI, Fair Supply out of Australia. They're working on a project with SHOP to also have the data that we need from construction projects. Xiaomi Construction built Grace Farms and they're part of this as well and being able to help that, um, do that mindful materials and so forth. It's, it's exciting to see a quick uptake too, right? In terms of everyone um, coming around this together. So the report is one that you can also download online. And we opened the report with a piece from Carrie Mae Weems. So Carrie is uh, a leading photographer and artist. And so this is something that I think in terms of being here is appropriate to, to open with and the report. So slave labor continues to build this country. Some people don't care. It's the game, the play, the luck of the draw, the gallop of unfettered capital. But for those who do care, for those with empathy, perhaps it's time to consider. Consider your privilege along with its impact. Consider who does what and why. Consider making less and gaining more. Consider the men, women, and children who make your lives easier and theirs harder, the farmer and the worker, the butcher and the barber, the baker and the builder, the nanny and the nurse. Consider the importance of change and why it matters. Then insist upon change across all the platforms of life. Consider what you want, what you need, and achieving it without exploiting others. Consider the role of industrialized nations, consider why empires collapse as colonies rise and know that mounting resistance to the imbalance is the order of the day. So as a report for the practitioners, this is how we opened it. And important to continue hearing from artists as we pursue this. The, these are the materials that are that are at risk, rubber, glass, fiber, steel, electronics, bricks, timber, stone, copper, iron, minerals, precursors, cement. And um, you'll see that in the toolkit. We do a deep dive in the toolkit on, in terms of uh, educating on it and also providing a commitment and implementation mechanisms. So each one, what we did is it was we put certifications in here, identify them that also have a fair labor, it has a third party audited labor. So in this case with Timber, the FSC certification is now added core labor requirements. So you might be adding and quite often do for FSC for lead certification, there's a double benefit now. So that's one. And we do that for each one of the materials. We also note which uh, nations produce uh, timber or each one of the materials at a high risk, the higher risk, not there's risk almost everywhere, but these have more uh, risk. There is um, also, in this case, we use that in terms of sawn wood and timber, and we show the, the risk factors. And then this is at Grace Farms. We use the wood that was felled on site for the billet for the tables, which was helpful, or we use the materials. Circularity is also important because it truncates the supply chain at the extraction level. 
So uh, that's also factored in to analysis. And then we have mass timber, which again, as you think is a sustainable solution, but we need to know where the materials uh, timber is sourced from and by whom. Copper is another one I find really fascinating too, because copper is about 50% of all copper is used in the built environment. And uh, right now we know that 65% of the undeveloped copper reserves and resources are located in close proximity to biodiversity conservation areas. So when we increase the demand, we're gonna double the use of the uh, of building materials by 2060, this is gonna be infringing on those in those areas. And also 47% are in close proximity to indigenous people's land. And this is the copper mark, relatively new, but it, it's it's very promising because there's inspection at the at the mining level. And then steel and iron is another one. So same sort of a thing. You can see the hazardous conditions. St steel is not a monolithic and it's, it takes a whole process uh, to produce steel. So we go into that in, in the um, you know, in the report. And then we identify too where iron ore, pig, you know, pig iron, limestone, all the elements are also at risk. And then you see a copper, uh, you know, you see a, a solar panel components. It's copper, aluminum, silver, steel, glass. It's not just the polysilicon too that is at risk. And again, we cannot have a, a sustainable solution if human rights are embedded in them. Probably this is another, um, you know, there's more research coming out. So built on repression, this is PVC building materials and it has a, um, a analysis in terms of forced labor in that supply chain as well. I'll skip over some of those. Solar panels, there's a lot, right? There's more than you think. So right now at the beginning, people think, oh, there's not much, but there is. And the other thing is that we have a, a real opportunity in textiles in terms of interiors, because there's been more accountability within the garment industry. So you have already some ethical transparency within the garment industry. And we're gonna to look to convert that to interiors. So that, that would be next. And also you can, you know, many people can you may say, I'm already started a project, but the end of the, of the project is interiors or the possibility with uh, less materials or uh, components are in the interiors. And so it's more plausible to start that, that inspection and that work. So within our toolkit, we have a D division one specifications uh, document that was helped to be produced by Gensler and our team that we brought together to do that. Material tracking schedules, you can start to do that. Once you know, you can't unknow it. So now there's a duty to act. So this is all of you. You now have this information and we can all get to it. So this is what we've been doing in uh, a pretty short amount of time. We had summits. So we had the UN um, High Commissioner on Human Rights, Prince Zaid Rad al Hussein, who came and said, all good revolutions begin like this. He too had not thought about the construction sector and, that was, and his term ended in 2018. So he came and recognized this is a really important opportunity. So same for you for, to really be involved is going to make a big difference. We had 500 leaders this, just this last March and um, and had uh, government, Arabs there, Miller Null, Richard Louis from uh, MSNBC. We had a bunch of people, I had 60 students from 23 universities, hopefully maybe you know, one of the classes will come uh, at our next one, which is on the 26th of March. So hopefully that will happen and we have an opportunity for students to come. This is that exhibit too. So everybody's getting, you know, getting after it here in terms of uh, that opening at the same time. And then the pilot projects are on those three. Uh, uh, we went, you saw that on the film. So I'll zip through this, but it's on three continents. We have a, a fourth one that we are anticipating to announce the new year. We have a number of new projects and one will be hopefully in Africa. And in terms of the Harriet Tubman, when we traced 21 materials. So that was timber, steel, concrete, and paint. And then Black Chapel, we had 16 of the uh, materials too. So we have a whole draft of that um, analysis is online. You can take a look at that. 
this is a, a small one. And then Turner on this project, when you came in my library, they have now uh, created, just been very committed and we're going to have an ethical, uh, it's going to be ethical supply chain workshop with 75 leaders. They're bringing their major suppliers. So it's Nucor and Otis Elevators and so forth. They're all coming along with the State Department's overseas building operations. That's all the embassies that are built around the world. And uh, they're opening with or hosting together. And it says a lot, right? That we're activating and they're committing to ensuring that our suppliers are also a part of the equation. And um, they're committed to ensure that we start to uh, really make headway on transparency in our supply chain. Another one was Serendipity Arts. Arab's on board because of that one and really working at it. This is the State Department again. And Grace Farms Foods. I have it in the in your office. So I don't have them here, but I'll have to bring it back at, um, at the reception. But another outcome is now being able to, since we already built, we have to, it takes work to actually create an ethical supply chain. And um, what we're doing now is making sure that we can, use with every cup of tea, a very, a very plausible way for people to engage. And that's already working, um, you know, started, we are the first and only premium tea company to be ethically and sustainably sourced. It's a B Corp and hundred percent of profits go to design for freedom. So it's starting to initialize conversations and boardrooms and, you know, companies were at JP Morgan and World Economic Forum to, many architecture firms and um, all those, and a lot of those that are in our working group too. So it's an important way to uh, be able to demonstrate what we're advocating for, like actually do it. And that's, and also we have women owned farmers. So you can start again, asking for what we wanna see is important. And that is the same thing uh, I'm here. And this is in India actually going on site. Uh, and here's the tea at our pavilion, when you come, you'll have something you can come. Um, but it's important that this is there, we're gonna wrap it up and we'll be able to have some uh, you know, questions, but it's important to be able to uh, you know, start the process and ask. So again, you can ask to ensure that the supplies you're working with to build right now, to do your modeling, you can start to investigate those materials. Uh, you can ask for representatives who might come to the school. How are they doing on their um, on their building material documentation for labor and so forth? So that's everybody has the agency. That's the main thing. And the last thing I want to wrap up with is uh, this is an important one: is that we're not just doing this. This is a clean hands, clear conscience. This is a uh, there was a opportunity for our faith initiative director, Matthew Crossman, who's director of life worth living at the Yale center to address the design for freedom. And I think this is about the most, you know, is a really important way to think about it. Clean hands, clear conscience. In the end, the choice between self and other is an important sense, a false one. We ought not to aim at clean hands and a clear conscience and clear consciences for ourselves, nor at liberation and human dignity for others, as though only their dignity is in jeopardy. In reality, our dignity too is threatened by our indifference to and estrangement from the suffering of our neighbors around the globe. Only in their liberation can we hope to find our own. Any dignity we might hope to secure will be shared. Any humanity we might hope to design will be something we share with one another. With these goals in mind, we can hope to find something far more valuable than clean hands or clear conscience. Perhaps we will stumble our way into mutual flourishing. That's a humane future worth designing. I think that's important because it's not just for those, for us that we actually do start to acknowledge that our profession, our, you know, how we're building is affecting many millions around the world and we have an opportunity for ourselves to make this happen. And we wanna make sure that we're making progress and building in a way that designed for freedom. And the stories that are told are are, are in this, um, are, are a way to have a more humane future. That's, that's 
a, a lot to digest. <laughs> so, but, uh, but thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're right. All right. So it's here it's open. I know. <laughs> um, questions. And I know you're the most, the, probably the most attuned to what this issue is too. So, mm -hmm. thank you. That was um, thank you uh, for coming, and uh, thank you for a very very fine presentation. Um, also, I must say it's it's nice to have. Uh, a, a laywoman, uh, not an architect, talking to us. It's, it's a delight. So thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, do you find that uh, in, in all of this work, there's a tremendous amount of work and thought that, that's evident in, in, in everything you've done and that you're doing. Do you find that where there is a, 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 a lack of regard for human nature, right? A disregard for it that there's also a disregard for nature. Do they go hand in hand? They definitely, it, yes. And, and what and what might you think about that relationship? Or if you could talk about that. It's the maybe. same, right. So in terms of those that are going to enslave people, they definitely have very little regard for nature. They definitely go hand in hand in terms of exploitation of the built environment, I mean, of nature as well as exploitation of people. And so, uh, so in terms of the potential to do both at the same time, to have a, you know, more, you know, more sustainable, environmentally sustainable future and a more humane future, they definitely go hand in hand. There's more oversight within the supply chain when you know, there's more government engagement, to, you know, so that there's uh, uh, compliance with these laws that do exist that are, you can see too with the legally logged timber, they apply both to nature and to people. Mm -hmm. No, it's very well, very much tied. And that's why ethical decarbonization is something you want to really propel in, in, in the in the current thinking. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hi. Um, Hi. So I have uh, two questions. Mm -hmm. um, the first is, do you all um, have or have you started to create kind of a repository of um, material suppliers and people like that who are ethically sourcing their materials so that architects can then use that as a resource when doing their projects? Or is it more on the architect to do that resource and you're just providing like the templates to fill? Right. And that's why I want the full ecosystem to be engaged. So it cannot be only on architects. Specify it can only be on the construction managers either. And um, so part of it is that so the technology uh, in platforms, that's going to be a big part. The mindful materials is creating a common, um, common material framework, and it's including all the health components, toxicity, and so forth, all in one place that will also include design for freedom filter as well. So that's, that's the aim. These are early days. So uh, you know, the thinking is to use AI as well as platforms and um, all the projects will yield also uh, suppliers, but that are committed is still a very dynamic, labor is more dynamic than it is um, like looking at the, the DNA of a piece of material to know, you know, or see the carbon sequestration, it's changes. So the oversight within a supply chain and the number of suppliers in the supply chain is always uh, fluctuating. But uh but yes, that, that is the aim. We need to make it, there's thousands of materials we need to simplify the process. Mm -hmm. And then the second question is, how much trust is there in some of these certifications that you're looking at that um, are labeling their products as ethically sourced? How much trust is there in those? Because I know sometimes those things can be paid for or they're not for sure. really at the kind of person person level accurately being reported. So how much... How much is there? Yeah. So we have a Brazilian architect. She's amazing. She's at USC and she's actually seen the FSC certification process in Brazil uh, be corrupt too. And so you know, firsthand. So it's definitely, and that's not, that's a well-known fact too, but it does nevertheless reduce the risk. So the way the meat, though, even though it cannot be relied on and a hundred percent having uh, the ability to, I mean, the, having a third party audited uh, role in the system is still going to reduce risk. So we definitely are not blind to the fact that it's it's not 100%. Mm -hmm. 
Hi, I was wondering if you could expand on what you mean by using AI in Design for Freedom. Mm -hmm. Yep. So there's a couple ways. Fair Supply is uh, is out of Australia, and they have a lot of construction data, and they're looking at mapping sort of uh, you know mapping the supply chain, and um, so that's like as, again AI is using a lot of data that comes in from t- trade data to um, you know, to certifications and you know, a lot and other reports that come out. Same with so Altana AI has mapped. Um, David says it's actually not like mapped. They've actually uh, taken probably fifty percent of all supply chains. This is also we're asking them to really work on construction. Um, so they're really. This is also a newer company and like new thinking, right? It's the, really the only way we're going to get as long as the input, the data that goes into the the um, AI tools are going to be um credible too but yeah it's it's really the mapping the supply chain end to end is what we're we're aiming for because the extraction level is at the highest risk it's the most hazardous less oversight Mm -hmm. so it's an important part of the equation and there's probably i I know cbp the, uh, the custom board protection had about 17 different ai firms other technical platforms that were that they were looking at and we had a, a convening on that. So there are more and there's, you know, there's a, a an opportunity here that we want to take. I have a difficult question for you. Uh-oh. <laughs> so, I mean, you designed this beautiful, you work with Sana to design mm-hmm. this beautiful place. Um, if you had to do it now again, what would we like? You think you get the same design or be different? Oh, so to me, the river building is exactly what we hoped it would be. When you build something, you don't know, right? You don't know until people are activating it. And so far, I mean, it is all that we hope for. I wouldn't change the river building. And what I like about it is that it can't be changed. It's not a building you can add on to. <laughs> you really are, you got know, to think with a longer uh, term lens. But in terms of how we built, certainly I would definitely be thinking about the materials in a different way. It was only fortunate that we used the wood that was felled on site for the the tables. Now I know those tables are ethically made. There's a lot of them. And we did that for environmental sustainable purposes. So a lot, we we have a lead certification and we also have how we operate. We're also the only double lead certification in Connecticut because we have both how we operate and how we built. And so I think all those efforts to still be sensitive to the environment uh, or yield good results, but not nearly what we could have done at all. I would do, I would be talking to steel manufacturers and, and, you know, I did talk to O&G actually, which is a concrete company and they're vertically integrated. So there's also less, less risk, but there's certainly the exposure um, on the, uh, on the concrete too. So, and cement, the Portland cement, where that come from. And then, you know, so you talked to them about that. So there's, um, yeah, there's there's a other there's other exposures that I think I could have spoken to the firms with that we worked with that we built with that could have yielded a lot of results. Hmm? I mean, positively. Okay, one last question before we go mm-hmm. to the reception. Anybody else? Thank and you, al- Sharon. And also, uh, and also, say one quick thing on the on the roof because that's a very visible piece. We asked Zayner uh, about that. I asked him forensically if they knew about the, you know, how far back they go in the supply chain. And they said, no one's asked us. So the point was asking. That's what I would say. Like it just ask and they were willing because it, most of the time people now say, well, are they, is it my secret sauce? I don't want to tell you my suppliers. And that's just not the case. So just ask you to be bold and ask questions, those suppliers, the representatives of firms and so forth. And to really uh, start to have a strong uptake, your, uptake yourself in order to ask the questions. Well, mm-hmm. here's the last question. Somebody finally decided. Okay, to... okay. Just... I was just wondering, um, is there anything being done to increase the transparency between the architect and um, the material supplier? Between the architects and the material supplier? Um, in terms of transparency? Yes, this is, so it's um, not only for the architects, but um, on labeling, hopefully, you know, they're, they're, hopefully that will come into play. But um, the same for the procurement side on the construction, because not all of the supplies are identified from your specifications. 
you know, quite often it's that up to the Turners and other, you know, Siami who built Grace Farms to determine which cement it has to meet a requirement, but which cement manufacturer and so forth, a lot of that. So it goes, the transparency is needed on both ends. And um, these are all the, the, the platforms we're, we're working with to incorporate fair labor, all the auditing, mainly the certifications that are helpful. And also whether or not you're using circularity, regenerative materials, and that's what we have right now. The AI is like the next big, you know, the next big thing. And that's, that's, these are early days on AI. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you all.